Uh, welcome. Uh, I am Dimitri Gursis, a professor at the Mechanical Engineering Department here at Khalifa University. Uh, today, I will talk about uh, the research we're doing here uh, regarding uh, the coronavirus spread. Uh, this is work supported by Khalifa University, and it is uh, work done with uh, Dr. Patsadzis and Dr. Abani. Uh, my expertise is in the modeling of reacting and uh, in, of uh, reacting and biological processes. Uh, however, with the start of the outbreak, uh, me and uh, colleagues of mine from Europe, uh, from countries that were hit from the virus first. Uh, we started exchanging emails uh, regarding the data that were announced, regarding the models that were available, and regarding the best ways to make uh, predictions. So through these discussions, I realized that, there was, uh, uh, I, I realized that my expertise uh, could be useful uh, also in the modeling of uh, the coronavirus spread. So today, uh, I will present an overview of the research we're doing here. Uh, first, I will describe uh, the models and the methodologies that are most popular uh, today. And then uh, I will mention the limitations of these models and these methodologies. Uh, finally, I will present an alternative methodology for making uh, predictions. And uh, I will present some uh, preliminary results. So the first uh, uh, model for the simulation of uh, the virus spread uh, was introduced more than 100 years ago. Uh, according to this model, the population under examination, this is the population of a country or a village, can be divided in three parts, in three compartments. Uh, the susceptible people, uh, these are healthy people that uh, uh, potentially can be infected, the infected people, and the recovered people. Now, an infected person interacts with the susceptible one and so the susceptible becomes infected. And of course, the infected one can become, uh, can recover. Now, this model has been extended uh, in order to account for the disease population. And furthermore, it was uh, extended to account for the exposed population. Exposed population are uh, persons that got the virus, but uh, they have no symptoms yet, and they cannot infect healthy people. Uh, this model was extended even further uh, to account for people in uh, quarantine and uh, even further to account for two different uh, infected populations. Uh, infected uh, people with normal symptoms and infected people with severe symptoms. Uh, this model was further extended uh, to account for the virus load in the environment like, for example, the virus that uh, exists on surfaces where we touch and from uh, which we also get infected. So the virus load became another way uh, to infect susceptible people. Of course, there are even more complex systems, like this one here. Uh, this model here uh, involves three different uh, populations that uh, can infect susceptible people and also accounts for or hospitalizations. Uh, and of course, they are even more complex than this. However, even from the simplest model to the most complex model, uh, can, uh, all these models can become more detailed if we uh, introduce uh, different categories in each uh, compartment. For example, uh, we can divide all these compartments uh, on the basis of the age, uh, gender, profession, or health. Uh, the other uh, issue with these models is that um, uh, these models can be applied to a country, to a city, a village, a neighborhood, or to a household. Uh, they can even be distributed uh, spatially in different regions. For example, we can divide the Emirates in three regions, apply three different models in each region, and then combine the results. Finally, Another important issue that uh, is of concern in these models is the laws by which a person can move from one compartment to the other. Say, for example, from the susceptible compartment to the exposed compartment. These laws are from very simple, like uh, those that uh, uh, 
use the law of mass action in chemical kinetics or very complex uh, based on stochastic uh, formulas. Now, this uh, uh, type of modeling was uh, very intense, as you can imagine, in the last few months, and they produce very significant results. Uh, here, I list uh, two of these, uh, two of uh, the publications uh, that were published uh, early March. Uh, on the left, it is uh, one uh, famous publication uh, by Imperial College. Uh, that was responsible for the reversal of uh, the governmental policy in the United Kingdom. So this is the paper that uh, was uh, responsible for enacting the lockdown in uh, Britain. The other paper is uh, a paper by Germans and uh, German and uh, Polish scientists and uh, also is a paper that influenced a lot the German government in enacting uh, from the very beginning uh, the lockdown. What is important in this uh, paper is that uh, they used uh, the very first model I show you, the one that was introduced more than a hundred years ago, but they applied this model on every house in Berlin and in every house in Rocklau. This is a city, a Polish city on the other side of the border. Uh, these models uh, were not only the basis for significant publications, but uh, were also the basis for significant computer programs. Uh, what you see here is one of the programs uh, released by Stanford University. This is a program that uh, deals with uh, scheduling uh, hospitalizations. But there are many more, uh, like for example, a program that uh, schedules uh, medical supply acquisitions. Uh, these are all from Stanford University. They are public domain. Everybody can use them. Uh, other universities uh, produce similar uh, codes uh, that uh, uh, help a lot the medical community uh, to face uh, the epidemic. How do we use this model? So I will briefly describe you uh, how do we use this model and what we expect out of these population models. Let's look at uh, the data from New Zealand. What you see here are data for infected, recovered, and diseased uh, people in New Zealand over time. And uh, let's suppose that uh, we are trying to make uh, use of the model you see on the upper left corner of your screen. Now, the process involves fitting the parameters of the models to this data and then getting profile out of uh, the differential equations that describe the model. So what we get uh, is this here. So what you see here is uh, superimposed to the data the profiles of this model. Uh, you can tell uh, the accuracy is not that great, is not bad either, okay, but this is the typical uh, accuracy that uh, we obtain from these models. This is one of the first uh, drawbacks and uh, the reason for that is that the complexity of the process under examination is much more, uh, it's, it's higher than the complexity that these models uh, can deal with. Uh, but there is another limitation, uh, more uh, significant ones, that has to do with the accuracy of the predictions. So now we go to South Korea, uh, we use the same model, and uh, we consider the data uh, for an eight days period from, day, from uh, the 19th of February to the 26th of February. And uh, we use this data, we start using this data in order to make predictions. Now what I will show you here is the profile we get from this data and also profiles that we get if in this data we have successively one more data set at a time. So on the left, you see uh, profiles for the infected population. And this is what you get. So here we add one point. We got this curve. Uh, now we're going to add another point. We get another curve. We add the third point. Fourth point. Fifth point. And so on. 
with every point we add to the set of data, we get different curves for the infected uh, populations. Now, uh, what I will show you now on the right are the corresponding profiles for the exposed population. So you see that just adding one point, data point, in the data set that are available, we get a completely different predictions. So clearly, these profiles uh, cannot be used for making predictions. Okay? And this is the result uh, of an ill-conditioned problem. This is the mathematical term to describe this type of behavior. Now, of course, there is a remedy to that. And uh, going back to the Imperial College report, uh, what you see here are predictions that were made. Uh, on the left, you see predictions on the infected pe people, on the middle, predictions of the diseased people, and on the right, predictions on the uh, reproduction number. So what you see here is instead of getting one curve, you get a range of values for predictions. Uh, so uh, this is done by using uh, quite sophisticated statistical techniques. And uh, this range uh, also uh, show you how credible is the range of the estimates. So this was uh, a very credible approach. Uh, it is still the subject uh, of uh, intense research by the mathematicians. Uh, but this is uh, the best uh, we have at this point in making predictions. So the question is whether there is another way to make predictions uh, that can make more precise predictions and more robust predictions. That is, predictions that do not depend on how many data we have, on which model we're using, and uh, so on. So this is uh, where my work comes in. Uh, my work is based on the notion of the time scale. Now, time scale. Uh, is a notion that uh, we all use. For example, uh, if I ask you how long it takes you to boil an egg, okay, you will say seven minutes. Okay, you're not going to say the equivalent of 0 0.11 hours. Also, if I ask you how long it takes you to fly to Athens, okay, you will say five hours. You're not going to say 300 minutes, which is equivalent to five hours. Okay, this is uh, our perception of, of, of a time scale. Uh, it is minutes for the egg and hours for a flight abroad. Uh, this is what we know as the measure of time that characterizes these two actions. Now, these two cases, the time scale is fixed. Okay? It always takes minutes to, fly to, to, to boil an egg. However, there are cases where the time scale can change with time. A very easy example is the growing, growing up process, uh, so that when we are young, uh, time, the, the, the proper time scale is years. When we are old, the proper time scale is decades. So I will use this notion uh, to make predictions in the coronavirus spread. So let's look uh, now at the China data. Uh, this is uh, a country in which the coronavirus epidemic uh, came to an almost uh, end, so it is an appropriate case uh, to examine. So we use again this uh, model. This is a relatively simple model. Uh, personally, I like this model because uh, it is prone to uh, less uh, errors. So this is what uh, uh, looks like when we fit uh, the China data to the profiles uh, of this model. So circles are data, uh, curves are solutions uh, from this model. Now, here it is the profiles we get uh, out of this uh, model with this specific uh, constants uh, evaluated from the China da data. Now, what you see is during the first 40 days, uh, there is uh, an exponential increase of uh, the exposed people, the infected people, 
uh, recovered people and diseased people. So everything blows up. So if we look at the time scales of this process, uh, we get uh, an explanation of this behavior. Uh, here you see the time scales. Uh, there are two types of time scales. There are time scales in red. So you see there are two time scales, uh, one slow and one uh, fast at the bottom. Uh, these are time scales that relate to components of the model that tend to drive the solution away from equilibrium. Uh, it turns out that the fast, the fast uh, growth time scale is the one that characterizes the early phase of uh, the epidemic spread. At the same time, there are uh, decay time scales. There are time scales uh, that uh, uh, characterize processes in the model that tend to drive the model to a fixed point. Now, uh, if we look at, uh, at the fast time scale, which is the one with the solid red at the bottom, uh, we can uh, associate uh, the generation of these time scales with the different paths in the model. So early on, the time scale is generated by the infecting paths in the model, while the recovery paths have very little effect. Later on, when the time scale is about to disappear, uh, it is the opposite. It is the recovery rates that have uh, great influence and the infecting uh, rates have uh, much less. Now, and this is the reason why the time scales at some point uh, disappear and there are only decay time scales which eventually drive the system uh, to equilibrium. Now, uh, this is the way that the influence of the transitions from one compartment to the other can be quantified. Uh, of course, uh, this result uh, reproduces what we know, uh, you know by intuition, that uh, mitigation uh, implies decrease of rate of infections and increase of uh, rate of uh, uh, recoveries. Now, if I superimpose these explosive time scales to the profiles, uh, I notice uh, something uh, very useful, that the end of the explosive time scale, the end of uh, the period in which growth time scales exist, coincides with the inflection point of the exposed population and also the susceptible population. These are the two populations early on in the model used. Uh, this is a very important property uh, because, uh, and it applies to all cases. Uh, here you see uh, on this table uh, the inflection point of the exposed population, the inflection point of the susceptible population, and here on the right you see uh, the time uh, at which the growth or explosive time scales uh, disappear. And you see that uh, all these happen at about the same time. Now, of course, there is a mathematical explanation for this, okay, but uh, it's good also to show uh, this result uh, in numbers. This is very important because the inflection point of the, expo of, of the, of the, the, inflection point of the exposed population uh, is a good early sign for the slowdown for the epidemic. That is, when this is recorded, then we know that uh, uh, the, 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 the explosive growth of the epidemic is about to reach uh, its peak. Now, of course, this is the results of the model, particular model we used. If we use a different model, for example, the simple uh, model here on the right, uh, there this model, uh, in, this, in the context of this model, uh, the end of the explosive regime coincides with the inflection point of the infected population. And this is another uh, indication of uh, uh, the end of uh, the epidemic growth. Now, if you look at the figure in the middle, these are the data from Italy, and with the vertical lines are the two exposed, the, the, the two inflection points uh, produced by the models on the left and the model on the right. And uh, at least uh, for the model on the right, uh, that we have the data, we can really see that uh, the inflection point predicted is very much at the point uh, one would expect. 
Now, the question is whether these results are robust. That is, whether these predictions, uh, this type of predictions, uh, are independent of the model we use, independent of how many data we have. So, uh, here you see uh, three different uh, countries, uh, explosive modes uh, at three different countries. Uh, for each country, the explosive time scales were computed on the basis of two different data sets. One small data set uh, indicated by the red arrow, uh, the, the, the horizontal red arrow, and a much larger uh, period, uh, which is indicated by the black arrow. Now, in all three cases, uh, the, the, the black region is, uh, extends further to the right uh, of all three figures, so uh, the two regions or the two sets of data are quite uh, different. Nevertheless, you see that in all three cases, the explosive time scale, which is uh, the, the branch of the curves you see at the bottom, uh, these are the fastest time scales, they are all uh, the same. Uh, that means that uh, this prediction is robust to the number of uh, data points that are available. Another interesting point here is that uh, the time scales, the characteristic time scales for the epidemic growth is pretty much the same. It's around four days uh, in these three countries considered and also the same for other countries that we consider as well. So the result here is that uh, this method of making predictions is robust to additional points uh, added. Next question is whether uh, robustness uh, is preserved when we use a different model. So here is uh, the case of Italy. Uh, the explosive or the growth time scales here in the middle. You see the two models uh, on the left and on the right. Uh, both models uh, basically reproduce uh, exactly the same time scale. So this is a demonstration that uh, the new method of making predictions is robust uh, with respect to different uh, models. Now, we examine this uh, type of analysis in the case where we have a resurgence. This is the case of Pakistan, where you see on the left, uh, where it shows the infected and the deceased people, uh, you see that uh, on about April 14, uh, the lockdown measures were uh, relaxed and uh, the number of infected and diseased people uh, increased uh, rapidly. Now, we did the same type, of, this, the, this new type of analysis in the two regimes before and after uh, the relaxation of uh, lockdown, and we found in both cases uh, the explosive or the growth time scales. Now, of course, you see that uh, in the early part, uh, the explosive time scale, the, the characteristic, it's always the fastest, uh, is um, uh, much faster than on the right, uh, on the second uh, regime. But also you see that uh, it is uh, the one on the second regime, it's much, short, much shorter than in the first regime. So in a sense, what this shows is that uh, the resurgent uh, regime was less intense than the initial regime. So we look at this and we try to find out why this is so. And it uh, turns out that uh, in the initial regime, before the lockdown, before the relaxation of lockdown, uh, initially uh, the time scale was uh, generated mainly because of the infecting paths, while the uh, recovery paths had uh, very little effect. Uh, of course, the situation was reversed at the end of this uh, explosive, first explosive period. But then if we look at the second explosive period, we saw that from the, the very beginning, the recovery parts uh, had a very significant influence. So these paths did not uh, allow for the uh, explosive regime to last uh, longer or at least as long as uh, in the first uh, stage. So uh, with this, I would like to conclude uh, the presentation of uh, the preliminary results. Uh, the main conclusion here is that uh, uh, looking at the dynamics of the model provides uh, a very robust way in making predictions. Uh, as we have seen, uh, 
Uh, it is uh, the effect of uh, different data sets or the effect of different models uh, is very small. So we proceed uh, in our research on, uh, along the lines uh, listed here. Uh, we do some theoretical work that, uh, we, it, that is needed to make uh, more predictions. Uh, we look at the influence of various factors on the growth uh, and also on the decay uh, of the virus spread. Uh, we look at uh, similarities and differences uh, in uh, various countries and we also assess the usefulness of the various models that are available. Uh, with this I would like to thank you and uh, uh, please uh, feel free to ask any question. Uh, okay, here uh, I see some questions. Uh, one is, uh, what was the second publication you talk about that was enforced in Germany? What was uh, this strategy about? Okay, so that was uh, that was uh, a model, uh, very nice model. It's uh, this publication here on the right and uh, what uh, these people did is uh, they apply the very very simple model I saw in the beginning uh, that was the one that was introduced uh, one century ago uh, they applied to every household in Berlin and Rocklau this, uh, this is a big city uh, in Poland uh, across uh, the border from Berlin and uh, the, then they, they, they use this very simple problem, but then they use very sophisticated statistical techniques uh, to assess uh, the impact of having or not having a lockdown. Uh, and then the conclusion was that uh, uh, they should have uh, the lockdown, and this is what uh, the German uh, government did. Uh, what is the expected? <laughs> what is the expected? Uh, uh, duration of uh, COVID. Okay, so of course I don't know, but uh, uh, you can get an answer uh, by looking at uh, the data from uh, from uh, Pakistan here. You see what happened uh, when the lockdown was uh, relaxed. Okay, uh, everything was up. Uh, before the lockdown, it seemed that the infected uh, population reached a, a peak, okay, but uh, it, then it blew up. So it's not... Uh, I guess nobody knows uh, how to answer this question. Uh, there's another question. What does the model predict when applied to the data from the UAE? Uh, we did, uh, uh, we are in the process of analyzing uh, the data. We don't have uh, uh, results yet. Um, okay, so uh, can we predict uh, what will happen to the infection by September? Uh, no, I don't know. Again, I, I just uh, I point out to, to what happened in uh, Pakistan. Uh, things can happen that uh, we don't know. Um, uh, what is... Uh, Hello, doctor. Yesterday, COVID-19 cases, one of the highest. Uh, what's your opinion about, uh, about it since uh, many countries relaxed the lockdown? Uh, I mean, there are many, many countries that uh, relaxed the lockdown, but uh, they're doing perfect. So I think it's, uh, there are many ways to relax the lockdown. So that we'll see about this. Uh, uh, how will the model plots look like uh, in the next two months? <laughs> I, I, that I don't know. Um, uh, has the easing of uh, restrictions led to a resurgence in all countries? Uh, as I said, no. No, this is not correct. I mean, there are many countries that uh, uh, relaxed uh, the lockdown, but uh, there was no resurgence. Uh, 
uh, uh, is it possible to use the characteristic scales to have an early warning or the so-called second wave? Okay, this is, <laughs> this is something that uh, we're still working on it. Uh, what, uh, again, you see in this picture on your screen, uh, you see what we get uh, after the start of the resurgence. Uh, we're trying to figure out uh, if we can get an early warning before that. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to thank you very much. <laughs>